In the year 2005, something happened that shook the world of computer software. It happened when id released the source code to the 1999 game Quake 3 Arena. Almost immediately, programmers discovered a tiny algorithm buried within it. To most programmers, the algorithm didn't make any sense, and it never would. It was simply akin to magic. Others couldn't accept magic in their midst, and a few would become obsessed with and consumed by trying to understand the algorithm. Soon, it took on a life of its own, with almost a cult following as junior historians undertook to find out who invented this piece of computer science wizardry and not only how, but why it worked at all. Somehow, it was several times faster than its fastest known contemporaries, but it didn't look like it did anything useful at all. That algorithm is now known as the fast inverse square root. And when I first saw it, there was only one person I could think of that could have been responsible. Someone I worked with back at Microsoft in the 1990s. Somebody insanely brilliant. The kind of mind that regular geniuses look at with envy and wonder. But if there's anything that Bill Gates taught me, it was never to name drop. So when I tell you that I worked down the hallway from Michael Abrash, it's not merely to impress you. It's to help explain why, when I first saw the brain-crippling fast inverse square root algorithm, I assumed it could only have come from his intellect. Abrash could well be the world's foremost expert on optimizing assembly language, having written such books as The Zen of Assembly Language and The Zen of Code Optimization and The Zen of Graphics Programming. Combine those three topics and you've got an obvious candidate for somebody who could have been qualified to have been the source. The thing is, however, I had no proof. I knew that Michael had left Microsoft to join it for the work on Quake just before this algorithm would have apparently been created, but it was still a pure guess. The algorithm might have come from id founder John Carmack, one of their other programmers, or some old obscure Soviet research paper, for all I knew. But the more I dug into it, though, the more I needed to know, because once I saw the algorithm, well, you'll know when you see it, too. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Well, that's about as long as I can remain that serious, especially on my birthday. Oh, and if you forgot to bring me a gift, just drop me a sub or like on that intro and I'll be more than happy with that. Before we get too much further into it, I want to reassure you that I'm not a math head. I'll only resort to the math when it's essential, and even then I'll make absolutely no attempt to impress anyone with my math chops. If anything, I will explain things using the same tiny little baby steps that my own brain requires when it comes to any kind of non-discrete mathematics. Check the video description for bonus links to the mathematics done with the appropriate amount of rigor. With that out of the way, back to the algorithm. The first thing I did, of course, was to email Mike and ask him what he knew of its origins. His answer was simple. He couldn't offer any insight because he'd never worked with it. So suffice to say, it wasn't his. I wasn't the first to follow this trail, however, and it would turn out to lead straight past Mike Abrash and on through John Carmack, back to SGI Indigo and beyond. But what makes it so special? What does it even do? Just from its name, we can assume that its purpose is to calculate fast inverse square roots. But precisely what is a fast inverse square root, and who needs one, and why do we care so much? In the world of computer graphics, vectors reign supreme. At its most familiar, a vector is just a 3D point in space with an X, a Y, and a Z value. But we're not best served by thinking of vectors as merely pointing to locations in space. Recall that a vector is a quantity having both direction and magnitude. Oh yeah! Vectors can also be used to define other quantities, such as planes. A plane can be defined by a point in space plus a normal vector, which is simply two vectors and is known as point normal form. In other words, vectors are everywhere in computer graphics. When you hear how many polygons some incredible GPU can transform through its pipeline every second, under the covers, it's really operating on the vectors that define those polygons. And the faster you can operate on the vectors, the faster your graphics, the higher your frame rates, and the better your realism. If you're a game publisher, it translates directly to success in dollars and cents. And it all comes down to fast vector math. One curious fact about vector math is that it's usually much easier to perform when the vectors are in what is known as normalized form. Normalized means that a vector's magnitude value is set to 1, which can be done by dividing all the other components by the overall magnitude of the vector. When you're done, the vector will be exactly one unit long and point exactly to some location on the sphere of the unit sphere. Now let's imagine we have a vector of 090. The magnitude of that vector is 9. 
We divide each x, y, and z component by 9 and we get 0, 1, 0, which is the length 1 vector that lands right on the unit sphere. That's precisely what we want and what we expected. If you're worried about what happens to the original magnitude, it can often be discarded if only the direction is needed. Otherwise, you can add another dimension to the vector, which we will call w. We'll start it at 1 and we'll scale it up as we scale down the other vector components. That way, if we ever need to get back to original form, it's preserved in the w. Nothing is lost and we still get the convenience of normalized form. But let's try a slightly less contrived case like 2, 3, 5. The magnitude of that vector is 6.16. Dividing each component by the magnitude yields a vector of 0 0.32, 0 0.49, 0 0.81, which is also on the unit sphere. These calculations were easy because I knew the magnitude, but how did I obtain it? Let's look at the magnitude on a 2D vector first, since we all saw this one back in elementary school. The length is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. Our 2D vector has an x and a y, or a run and a rise. To get the length, we simply use a Pythagorean theorem. And then to apply it in more dimensions, we only need to include additional terms. That means that the magnitude of a 3D vector is the length is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. A computer programmer would never actually square a term or raise it to the power of 2. They would simply multiply the number by itself, which has the same effect, but with multiplication being much easier than exponents, it's just faster to do. Thus, we wind up with length is equal to the square root of x times x plus y times y plus z times z. Going back to our simple 2, 3, 5 vector, we apply the math. The length is equal to the square root of 2 times 2 plus 3 times 3 plus 5 times 5, which is the square root of 38, which is that 6.16441400029 number, and so on. Dividing each individual term by the overall magnitude, we see that x over 6.16 equals 0.32 y over 6.16 equals 0.49, and z over 6.16 equals 0.81. Now we can easily check our work by plugging those numbers back into the Pythagorean theorem, where we should expect them to yield a length of 1. And indeed, other than a small rounding error because I'm only working this out to two digits, it works. h, or the length again, equals the square root of x times x plus y times y plus z times z, which is the square root of 0.32 squared and 0.49 squared summed with 0.81 squared. That works out to the 9986. From basic algebra, we can recall that dividing by the square root is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal of the square root, or 1 over the square root. Thus, the truly critical operation we're trying to perform here is the inverse square root. If we grant for a moment that this operation is critical to computer graphics, performing it as quickly as possible is now our goal. You're going to think I'm just holding out on you if I don't show you this algorithm at some point, so I'll do it, but it's going to be look like voodoo nonsense. We'll come back and revisit it once we've laid some more groundwork, but for now, here it is. All right, real quick, three halves is just the constant for three over two, and x2 is the incoming number, divided by two. y is the original number. Next, we take the address of the floating point number and then recast it as a long pointer, and then take its value as a long, which is actually an undefined operation in C. We then take half of that result and subtract it from the constant 0x5f3759df. We finally smash that integer result back into the floating point memory for some reason before applying what is apparently a Newtonian iteration to remove any remaining error. There's a second iteration pass that's commented out. This thing didn't really do any work, it just smashed some bits around in floating point form and then subtracted stuff from a constant, so it doesn't make a whit of sense at first glance, but does it work if you type it in and compile it? You bet. Is it fast? Absolutely. And rest assured, we'll test at least four variations of the inverse square root to find out just how fast it is. But how accurate can it really be? Well, it's within 1% for everything I tried. If you uncomment the second iteration of Newtonian refinement, it's barely any slower and it's far more accurate, coming in as precise as about one part in 10,000. Before the Quake version has any hope of making sense, though, we need to understand two things. How to find a square root and how floating point numbers work on modern computers. Both are important to understanding how it works. Let's start with a trivial implementation that we have a better hope of understanding. When I started coding, the 8-bit processors lacked any form of division instruction or multiplication at the CPU level, so square root would be a subroutine supplied by your compiler vendor or a subroutine you wrote and called in assembly language. Today, most all chips provide a useful division instruction, which means this is directly translated into a square root instruction using a compiler intrinsic. Thus, our code can be as simple as an inverse root returning 1 over the square root of n. It's just that easy if we're allowed to let the compiler and the floating point unit on the processor do the heavy lifting for us. 
And while today the FPUs are effective enough that this is a reasonable approach, this was far less true back on the hardware of the 1990s. And even today, if you want to parallelize work on a GPU that doesn't natively support square roots or inverse square roots, you absolutely want the fastest algorithm you can find to perform those discrete steps. The Quake version also accepts a floating point number, but if we could live with an integer, perhaps we could find a simple Newtonian approximation of our own as follows. Now, there are two points in the video where I'm going to give you some math and some commentary without going all the way back to first principles, and this is one of them. Understanding Newton's method for finding roots requires that you are comfortable with logarithms and understand some calculus, but I don't want to lose a bunch of people here, so keeping in mind that a good compromise means everybody's a little unhappy, here's my layman's version of how it all works. Newton's method is a trial and error approach for finding the solution to a function, or its root. Essentially, you start with a guess. You want to then continually refine that guess and home in on the right answer, so you iterate on it by making the next step equal to the previous step, less the function's rate of change at that point, multiplied by the current value wherever you're at. Why do we need to know the rate of change? Ah, because it helps us to optimize where to make our next guess. Consider that a truly lame approach would be to just start too high and then subtract some amount each time, try again and repeat until you're close enough. That would be hugely inefficient, however. But what we really want to know is how much lower can we make the next guess and still be safe? Why use the rate of change? It's because Newton's method employs the function's derivative, a concept from calculus that amounts to finding a helper function that describes the function's original slope, or the rate of change at any point along its curve. We know that we've picked the point at x0 that is too high, but how much too high is it? Well, we can extrapolate where our x would cross at 0 if we started here and applied the instantaneous rate of change all the way back down to 0. Using the current rate of change will mean that our line would actually be tangent to the real function. We don't know where the real answer is, but we know that it's at least safe to be this far away, and so that's where we're safe to make our next guess. x1 turns out to be too high as well, so we extrapolate back to the point x2, and now we try there. We simply keep repeating this process until we've reached whatever level of accuracy we require, or until we drop below the target. As you can see, each iteration takes us incrementally closer. It just takes some time, but you can solve pretty much anything to any level of accuracy that you might need. Now, back in high school, I was fairly bad at math and yet pretty good at programming, so I wrote a quadratic function solver for my trusty old Sharp EL5103S, a calculator which I still have and love. Good old Mr. Grazina was no fool, however, and promptly noticed that while I could solve pretty much anything, I never showed my work and I spent a lot of time entering iterations into my calculator. I did rock the few multiple choice tests we had, though. One problem is that once you get up to polynomials of the fifth degree or higher, it's been proven that no such formula can even exist. But Newton's method will still solve it by brute force. Now, Dave's easy cheaty way of finding the derivative of a simple function is to reduce the exponent by one and multiply by the old exponent. Thus, if our function were f of x equals x squared, the derivative, f prime of x, is 2x. If you're not sure why, just humor me on the calculus, but at least you won't be able to spot all my mistakes. A square root can be written as a function of x being x to the raised to the power of 1 half. The derivative is then 1 over 2 times x to the power of 1 half. Or, put another way, it will be half of 1 over the old value. To apply Newton's method then, at each step, we need to move by that amount multiplied by the current position. That's how much we will add or subtract, depending on which direction we're moving in. For our simple square root algorithm, you must start somewhere, so we'll make our initial guess being half of the input number. Our next guess at any stage will be the current guess plus or minus one over the old value multiplied by the input number, all then divided by two. That's our maximum safe rate of change at any point. As long as the next guess remains too high, we repeat. Rather than keeping a series of guesses like x0, x1, x2, and x3, x so on, it uses a loop and it just alternates between x0 and x1. Now in the end, I don't know if I've made it any easier to understand Newton's method, but if nothing else, you should be able to at least think of it in terms of an iterative approach at finding a solution to a problem that progressively improves its accuracy as you make each subsequent attempt. That much will get you by. Now we leave the comfort of our integers and explore the world of floating point. When Bill Gates and Paul Allen were confronted with the task of adding floating point math support to their fledgling Altair basic interpreter, they did what any reasonable young pair of go-getters equipped with an assembler and a dream would do. They hired an expert for cash. And that guy was Monty Davidoff, college dorm mate of Bill's who studied applied mathematics at Harvard. I guess one night in the Harvard dining hall, Bill and Paul were complaining that they weren't looking forward to writing all this floating point code, and that's when Monty chimed in to proclaim that he'd done it before. He convinced them that he was more than capable of doing it again, so they agreed to let him have the task. At the time, there was no standard for floating point numbers, and so Davidoff had to set one. 
It became known as Microsoft Binary Format, and it's still in use today under the specification known as IEEE 754. Have you had that feeling yet? The one that says, oh no, there's no way. He can't wrap this up in time. It must be a two-parter. And indeed it is, because in the conclusion, we'll look at floating point format so that we can appreciate how the algorithm smashes all the rules, stuffs bits where bits don't belong, and generally abuses the compiler in ways that I'd never seen before. All that's coming up in the next episode, so please make sure you're subscribed to the channel so that you don't miss it. If you found this episode interesting or entertaining, please do let me know by giving it a thumbs up. And if you didn't, by all means, absolutely give it the old double thumbs down. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. And a few would become obsessed with, obsessed with, this is the right tone. Yes, now it is. Yes, I enjoy this much better. Back in the year 2005, Sorry, I'm recording. What's up? Hi. In the second variation, it loops. Thanks to C++ inheritance, it's a little more in Yeah. Ha ha. No. If that's the case, you can simply plas. Bah, plas. Yes, you must plas the constant. Plas it. The user or caller of the class need not know anything about this. It just happens automatically because we've overrode the. Ah, overrode it. Did we overrode it? We overrode it with my ranged rover. Ranged rover. Here you can see the audio buffer class defines its own new and delete operators that call PS alloc and PS free. <clears throat> ah. PS free. Freedom. Freedom. Freedom from audio buffers.